Hello and welcome to Creating in Color, sharing the creative endeavors of people of color. I'm your host, KB, and today I'm joined with Marco, an animator whose past projects include Cuphead the Video Game, several DreamWorks TV series, Animaniacs, and The Cuphead Show. How are you today, Marco? I'm pretty good. Thank you for letting me be on the show. Thank you so much for being on the show. <laughs> so what is an animator? An animator is someone that uses multiple images to create the illusion of life or movement. And that can be done in many different ways. So there's like stop motion or hand-drawn 2D traditional or uh, even 3D. And then there's other stuff like motion graphics and pixelation with actual people. There's many different ways to do it. And what type of animator would you say you are? I mainly focus on 2D traditional animation. So that's more leaning towards hand-drawn work. Uh, I have done some puppet, like 2D puppet stuff as well. But my preference is towards traditional. What is puppeting animation? 2D puppets are created with uh, these kind of cut out pieces of characters and then sometimes you add additional drawings to it but most of the time you're just kind of sliding these pieces around so it's kind of like playing with like construction paper puppets pa you know paper puppets kind of thing oh interesting yeah. kind of like south park in a way but not necessarily always like south park <laughs> <laughs> yeah a little bit more advanced than that uh but south park is 2D puppets, essentially. Although I, I'm pretty sure that's done in Maya. How did you get started in the animation industry? Uh, my first gig in animation was uh, the Cuphead video game. And I got that after my second year at Sheridan College. Normally, we get internships in our third year. But after second year, I decided to just try and apply to places and see if I could even get a position. But I looked more towards smaller studios. And I knew about the Cuphead game for a little while, but it wasn't as big as it was at that time. And I looked on their website, and I found that their location was the same city where Sheridan was. So I just decided to just email them on a whim and be like, hey, do you need any help? I'm from Sheridan, and then it took a while, like a couple of weeks, and then they replied, and they were interested in working with me uh, as a cleanup artist and a little bit of grunt work, like scanning ink pieces and whatnot. And luckily, I messaged them, that was in 2015, uh, before E3 that year, because that was the year when they got big, and they presented at the Xbox press conference. So I joined in just a week after E3. And during my time on Cuphead, I was a cleanup artist. And I did some inking, some animation work, like just tiny stuff like effects. Uh, the onion tears are mine, little splashes on Calamaria, um, just tiny things. <laughs> Ooh, but, you're famous. <laughs> no, uh, it was it was a cool experience because I got to see uh, this archaic way of animating that no one really does anymore. Yeah. And Chad, one of the creators, would occasionally like pull me over and be like, what do you think about this? So I did get some input on the video game as they were creating it. And I was there brainstorming ideas for like how to show progress because when they would play test, no one knew how far they went in the game and whatnot. So I had to pitch ideas for the progress bar that's in the final game. Interesting. Yeah, that one was fun because I came up with a bunch of ideas, some mock-ups. Uh, it started out as like a radio tuner. And then I started looking at carnival games and then thought of those little horses that kind of go from left to right when you shoot water at it. And it just evolved from there and they did their own thing. And it was, it's cool. Because it's like, oh, I, I helped with that. <laughs> <laughs> to you, what does it mean to work in animation? I think it means you have to have some enjoyment of the entertainment industry. 
you have to have some passion for it. Otherwise, like, why are you in here? <laughs> right? You could be doing another job that pays way better. That's more stable too. I think everyone in this industry has some passion for it and really wants to make a mark in the world in some capacity. You know, they want to contribute to these landmark films that everyone enjoys and like influences themselves growing up. Yeah. Did you always know you wanted to get into animation or did you have interest in other industries? Oh, I've always wanted to get into animation. Oh. Uh, since as long as I can remember, I always wanted to draw and I watched so many cartoons growing up, you know, um, like Animaniacs, Rugrats, bunch of Looney Tunes, even the old stuff like Popeyes and stuff. They'd show up on TV every now and then and I'd watch them. And there's a story that my aunts always like to tell where when I was younger, my mom asked me, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then I said, I want to be an actor. And then she was impressed. She's like, oh, what kind of actor? Uh, a drama, action, comedy. And then I said, I want to be a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so here I am now, <laughs> basically, you know, acting in animation. Uh, so it's a dream come true. But at one point in high school, I did have just a teeny interest in cooking. Uh, it was in, like, when I was about to graduate, I did apply to a cooking school. And the other option was to take this general arts course, because my art course in high school was bad. Mm. Uh, so it was a choice between, like, an easier route, which is cooking, or a tougher one, which I had to train in arts and then apply to animation. But I decided, oh, what choice would I regret later down the line? And then I just kind of stuck to animation. <laughs> I have to ask because I love food. Oh, did you have like a specialty in mind if you were going to follow that path? Cooking? Um, yeah. I don't know particularly. Because I did take a cooking class in high school, and that was just like this general thing. So we did do some baking, and we did do some like casual foods, and then sometimes even fancier ones. Like I remember we made like a fancy mac and cheese, and it was so good. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I would have done not baking. Baking for me is a little scary. It's almost like chemistry. <laughs> Whoa, really? Because you have to get everything correct. And then, I don't know, for me, it just scares me. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. And then you have to, like, let... There's a lot of time involved with that. you got to let the bread proof and stuff. That makes sense, <laughs> yeah. Cooking's a little more forgiving. Mm-hmm. It's a little faster. And I just want to eat it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Do you notice a difference working on a traditional animated project versus a digital animated one? Uh, yeah, there is. For traditional work, it's a lot more difficult because you're constantly redrawing every single frame. And because of that, you need people that have a strong drawing skill and understanding of like even 3D form. Even with like very flat looking shows, having that foundation of understanding form and rotation really pumps up those kinds of 2D animations. In terms of digital ones with puppetry and sliding, it's a lot more forgiving and you can get away with tinier stuff. Like, settles are far more easier than in traditional. You don't have to draw as much, so you can just use whatever is there and then you just switch, like, hand poses. It's, it's still difficult and to animate like that, you have to come in with a different mindset as well. There's some shows that are a mix of both traditional and digital animation. And when you do that, you kind of have to take the strengths of digital and take the strengths of traditional animation. I do want to backtrack a little bit. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that one of the shows you grew up on was Animaniacs. What was it like? being a fan of Animaniacs when you were a kid to getting to work on the reboot of it. How did that feel? Oh, that was like a dream come true. I 
never expected to work on a show like that in my life because you know you're in school and then you saw like this heavy emphasis on just like 3d animations the next thing and then 2d started booming and then it was mostly just 2d puppet stuff i don't have a problem with it i like it too it's just like the quality of animation from uh like freakazoid and animaniacs like nothing has existed like that since then mm-hmm. and then when i heard that the show was being rebooted i was afraid it was just puppet but then i found out that it was all traditional it was a great experience and it was just phenomenal because all of its hand drawn i'd say 90 percent of its hand drawn we do use some shortcuts from digital stuff such as symbols but very rarely and i got to flex my strengths on that show unlike more flat 2d shows where i can't really push things as far as they can go those shows tend to want to restrict the designs to the assets that are just given so it's very free (laughs) to do whatever you want cool so it's interesting that your experience is all animated tv shows I've had some other guests who are animators who've worked on 3D features or they're in the video game industry on 3D projects, but never 2D. But I wanted to ask, do you mind going into your experience with the Canadian animation industry? Do you think this is a reflection of why your experience is mainly in television? Yeah, I think so. There's a lot of 2D work here in Canada. Even 3D, I think there's a good mix. In terms of Canadian animation, there's just like, there's a lot of pros and a lot of cons. Good things about it is that there's just a whole ton of work here. So much, like across the country, you have on the West Coast, you have Vancouver, which has a bunch of VFX, 2D, 3D feature. And even north of Vancouver, there's some cities with studios there. And then you have like Edmonton with big game studios like BioWare. And then even, I just found out recently, Winnipeg has some. Ontario's giant with a bunch of smaller Toronto boutique studios, as well as big ones like Nelvana. The cities surrounding that as well also have a lot, like Mississauga, my hometown. Hamilton, Ottawa has a bunch of animation studios there. Montreal, video games, VFX, the whole thing. Halifax and the Maritimes on the other side of Canada. I have friends there working in animation both 3D and 2D. So there's a lot of work here and it's mainly because the states would outsource their work to us. I think a lot of the 2D stuff is. Mercury is known for taking a lot of Disney stuff such as the Mickey Mouse and Tangled series. Most VFX work is here as well. Uh, Where am I going with this? (laughs) Uh, But depending on where you are in this country uh certain locations kind of lead more toward certain positions but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no storyboarding work here in vancouver but there is less of it compared to ontario and montreal but there is still work and there's just so much of it a lot of people tend to overlook the smaller ones i interned at a very small toronto studio that does a lot of kids web shows and they also have an adult side uh tin man hmm. there's also a bunch of motion graphics stuff you have giant ant there's there's just a lot <laughs> another things about canadian animation like we have the nfb which is this government funded kind of film board where they fund a bunch of independent films it's also known for the animation work that they have produced There's a bunch of Oscar-nominated shorts that have come from the NFB. Uh, They really push the boundaries of what animation can do and what it can tell. But there's also, like, a negative side to our industry. I don't want to go too much into detail about it, but you'll see it in the news where there's, like, unpaid overtimes and people having health issues from overworking a uh, bunch of crunch. This is mostly due to we don't have a union for animation oh, here. I was going to ask. Yeah. From what I can tell, Titmouse just recently, I don't know the full details of it, uh, started one. So it's just, it's up and coming. <laughs> There's also the fact that like our wages are pretty low. They tend to be about three times as less what people in the States are getting. What? 
Yes. <laughs> and then there's also the issue of uh, some people in other studios collaborating with LA studios. And then you have people in the same position as those in LA getting paid less <laughs> than the LA counterpart doing the same job on the wow. same project. Yeah, that's very demoralizing. But sometimes you just have to kind of deal with it. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, it's a little sad. And then in terms of pitching ideas and shows, it's not as strong as it is in the States. I've never pitched a show, but I have spoken to many people that have. Mm -hmm. From what I can observe is that there tends to be a lot of meddling with really higher up people to the point where like they want to change the idea. And sometimes when it does get produced, it becomes like this completely different thing than they initially pitched. But it used to be very good, though. Like, back in the 80s, Nelvana was pumping out a lot of shows, like Care Bears, and they even had their own feature, uh, Rock and Roll. Yeah. So I don't know what happened along the way <laughs> to make it become the way it is right now. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it starts to change. Like, I remember speaking to someone that's pretty high up in one of these big studios, and even they knew how messed up this Canadian animation industry is and they were like it's up to your generation to change it like I know it's bad <laughs> you guys need to like put your foot down and like make sure you guys create the stuff that you want to create so everyone knows it's bad some people want to like keep it on the down low but it's bad <laughs> it could be better is all in terms of work there's a lot of work a bunch of great projects I don't want to scare people away from the Canadian animation industry. Uh, if you like to animate, there's a lot of animation work here. I know people from the States have moved up to Canada because they just didn't enjoy boarding or character designing. They wanted to animate and there was no animation jobs down there. Right. Even from different countries, there's a lot of people I know from Brazil or Europe and even in Asia, like Philippines, Malaysia and all that. So a lot of people from around the world come here for animation work, and it's pretty a diverse workplace. Do you feel in order to be successful in this industry, you need to be an artist? I think so, yeah. To me, an artist is someone that can express an idea in some capacity, whether that's like cooking or drawing, singing. And for a lot of people in this industry, it's... Sometimes it's like, oh, I want to make a character perform in a certain way. And I think that requires like an artistic eye, a creative one. So I think, yeah, you do need to be an artist. What does it mean to be an animator? To be an animator, you need to be very versatile. You need to be able to adapt and, you know, be able to take on different kinds of work that's given to you. Because... You never know what kind of scenes that you get. Some You might have strengths. Like for me, I really love cartoony, exaggerated performances. That's my jam. That's my strength. And occasionally I would get shots that are not in my comfort zone, like just basic talking shots or just subtle kind of movement stuff. And for me, I don't find that enjoyable. But I just kind of have to do it because it's given to me. And... You try to figure out how to do it because the reason why I don't like it is I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to give subtle performances. So you constantly have to learn and figure out and problem solve. Even effects stuff. I'm not the strongest effects artist, but I've been given effects scenes and I got to go look up how to do smoke or how to do lightning and then do my best, <laughs> essentially. So you'll constantly be on your toes as an animator and you need to be able to do what's given to you. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> what does your daily routine look like? It depends on the studio, different studios operate. I guess I can speak about Titmouse where I was given a good chunk of scenes to animate and I had to reach a certain quota of frames per week. And at Titmouse, they do this really cool thing where they have dailies twice a week. So you would present your scenes for 
your entire team to look at and you get feedback from the supervisor and sometimes your team members and then you get to see other people's scenes so you can kind of learn off of them as well it's like oh how did they do that oh, it's like how did they how did they do this and then you ask them and then you get tips so it's a really nice environment there as an animator um at netflix it's very different it's a lot more hands off i'm still trying to get used to it cuz i'm so used to reporting to someone giving things to people but at netflix it's a lot of a uh, you kind of find your own work and do it <laughs> interesting what support or resources do you use or recommend for someone trying to break in um i'd say draw from life as much as you can it really enhances your ability to to draw and even see form especially as an animator like everyone thinks that oh i need to draw at a studio and what not in order to get better and it's like no you can just go to a cafe draw people that are just drinking coffee and what not draw in your room draw your room the way it is cuz you learn a lot from that another thing is take inspiration from work outside of animation cuz i feel like nowadays a lot of people tend to reference animation work for their own stuff versus old you know the golden age of animation people used to just ref and they still do they reference you know artists fine art um illustrators outside of this little bubble that we have and that's how they innovate and try new things um i just have this huge interest in fine arts and i take ideas from paintings or even just graphic designs like oh i like the color of this logo i'm going to use that on this painting so try to find inspiration in places you wouldn't necessarily expect very nice <laughs> thank you so marco mhm mm what was your upbringing like um it's actually very difficult um oh. i <laughs> it's okay i'm willing to be open about it uh, okay uh i was born in the philippines i and then i moved to canada when i was 3 uh grew up in mississauga ontario with within a family of 5 so i have uh mom and dad um older sister and an older brother I'm the youngest it was very difficult cuz i grew up in a very low income household so it was very hard to get by um you miss out on a lot of opportunities cuz sometimes like oh here's a field trip can't afford it can't go you know sometimes you don't have lunches <laughs> for school and what not so it was a struggle but it makes you appreciate what you have so like let's say i get a video game for christmas like i learn to just cherish that and get the most out of it because that's just like once in a while kind of thing. So, yeah, just growing up poor was very difficult, you know, you're so moving a lot. Um a lot of things are geared towards people who do have some semblance of money, not necessarily like upper class, such as at school, I remember applying for internships, there was opportunities abroad, but they only give grants to people that got those opportunities and it's like well i can't even afford the visa <laughs> you know and mm -hmm. if you can afford the visa you can already afford going abroad i had no help from my family not their fault financially for school so you know i had to take out loans and what not so Yeah, I just wish that I had the opportunity to go abroad and, you know, get to experience these studios elsewhere, but you know, I just had to stay within Ontario within the budget that I had, which was my loans. Mm. So, yeah, it was again, just very difficult. You miss out on opportunities. And then on top of that, my uh mother passed away at 13. So that kind of exacerbated the whole low income struggle for money kind of lifestyle. And 
it was also eye opening for me at a young age, because you know losing a family member kind of makes you grow up like ten years faster. Uh, yeah, you just learn to appreciate and love the people around you, and especially my parents, because they're not really the typical strict Asian parents that are like you know uh, go be a nurse and whatnot. Oh, come home at this time. Uh, they were very encouraging of our interests in, you know, trends, fads, you know, hobbies. So my mom really encouraged uh, me drawing and whatnot. And her passing away was a big motivator for me to work hard and make sure that she would be proud of me if she were alive today. Yeah, and then that a little cherry on top is that my sister passed away <laughs> just even three years ago. That was extremely difficult too. Um, that was just before moving to Vancouver for work. Um, she was my biggest inspiration in art. She also loved fine art. She had the same tastes as me: music, movies, and whatnot. Uh, when I was younger, we would always draw comics together. I always wanted to draw like her because she was so good after she passed away it was you know the same thing with my mother where it's like it it motivates me to work as hard as i can to make them proud um i i know they're proud of me <laughs> yeah. i know my sister was because she was able to see at least my final film at school and you know i remember her crying and being happy that you know, I was doing what I've always wanted to do, and she knew that. So, yeah, growing up is difficult. Uh, I learned to appreciate life, essentially, uh, and have a good balance between work. I really appreciate you sharing that with oh. me. Oh, I, no I can tell that everything that you went through and experience has really shaped you into just a wonderful human being and thank you very much and i feel <laughs> like this will help other people who might be going through something similar to what you're going through i i, I hope so because it's like especially when you're coming from low income uh you have like family members even family friends that kind of pressure you to get into a job that's like extremely well paid yeah want you to be in the same situation mm -hmm. right and I did get that a lot growing up not from my family but just people around mm -hmm. where they'd be like go into nursing you know your cousins in nursing um there's money in nursing there's no money in art and then now they're seeing me being successful in my career and they're impressed and they don't say that much anymore uh and i'm and i'm already seeing the impact of it i think because like one of my cousin's kids draws a lot and they're encouraging they're encouraging him to keep drawing and i really oh. hope he gets into it in the future because he likes captain underpants too oh that's so good yeah and he watches he watches it, the show, and I've worked on it. So I, hopefully I can inspire him to get into it as well. That's so good. I love it. <laughs> Outside of work, what kind of hobbies, side hustles, or interests do you engage in? I love video games, like, so much. I play a whole ton of video games, different genres. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just have this huge passion for it. And, like, I just love talking about it. I like looking forward to new games, um, like from indie to AAA stuff, like all of it. Um, Do you have a favorite series? Uh, in terms of series, oh, damn, that's hard. <laughs> Top three favorite series? Top three, okay. I like, my number one game is Portal. I love Portal. That's a good one. It's a well-crafted experience. Um, I grew up with Ratchet and Clank. 
I really love that's, that. That's another good one. <laughs> yeah, uh, not a lot of people talk about it enough. It's like it captures this Saturday morning cartoon vibe that I love. It really does. It. I mean, I could seriously go down a whole rabbit hole, but we ain't got the t- kind of time on this <laughs> podcast. But <laughs> yeah. yes, please continue. So there's that, and I just uh, also love Bioshock. Just it's so it's like one of the most well realized worlds in anything to be honest like rapture is so immersive and believable and like i've replayed that so many times to the point where like i can quote some audio logs <laughs> <laughs> and apart from video games i also like enjoy uh weightlifting so i like going to the gym um i didn't get into it until like my last year at school and then started taking it seriously when I moved here in Vancouver. So pre-COVID times, I would go like five times a week. And it's just, it really makes you feel better. Yeah. It's almost, I always tell people, it's like, it's almost like a puberty that you can control. Because <laughs> you, you get to look the way you want it. <laughs> um, and you just get a lot of energy out of it. And you feel positive most of the time. And, you know, unfortunately, COVID's kind of put a little halt to that. Mm -hmm. And I've only gone a few times since then. Do you have any tips for someone who might be starting weightlifting themselves and don't know how to begin? My biggest fear when I started was like other people in the gym staring. Mm -hmm. But majority of time, people don't care what you're doing. Unless you're like doing it completely wrong. But even then, like they'll approach you in a very respectful manner and they'll be like uh careful of your back kind of thing uh and everyone started out the way you did whether you're like extremely scrawny or a little overweight that big muscle dude was like either one of those at one point and you shouldn't be jealous of them they should like motivate you to be like yeah i can i can be like that someday That's encouraging, actually. As someone who's in constant fear of being judged when I either work out in public or a second thing I can't think of right now, that actually makes me feel a lot better. Yeah. Like, granted, like, you yourself will stare at people, but, like, you really, in the end, just don't pay them as much attention as you think. Because going, when when I started, I was always like, oh my god, someone's watching me only bench press 10 pound weights. And it's like, no, they don't care. <laughs> they're just, it's just, they're just glad that you're lifting. Very nice. What do you feel are the next steps in your journey? For me, I hope to, like, my biggest goal is to just direct something. My idea or someone else's idea, I'd love to direct because i have confidence in my ability to give feedback and have a specific vision um and coming from a production side i know the difficulties and the struggles of what it takes to create you know a show or a film because there's a lot of things that pre-production just doesn't understand because they're so disconnected from it it's like Sometimes they board something a certain way without realizing like, oh, this is a huge headache for, you know, background artists or even animators. And back then, there was a lot more animators that were directors because of that. They understood the whole production. They knew how to kind of cheat things, make things easier for the animation. A modern example would be like Gendy. Gendy's boards are phenomenal because they're just well-staged and simple enough for the production like if, if you look at it he tends to hide like the feet like walking in animation is just a huge pain in the butt <laughs> so if you look at his work he tends to hide the feet if there's any walking scenes and it's just like yes that's that's smart <laughs> so hopefully i can kind of find my way into that position but it's difficult now because a lot of people tend to favor storyboard artists who I have no idea how things actually get made. Not to say like they're not good. It's just like I just wish they had an understanding of the difficulties. You should shake it up. 
<laughs> I hope so. <laughs> that's that's uh, I, I'm trying. It's just figuring out how to do it. <laughs> well, I believe in you, so I look forward to when you help the industry as a whole. <laughs> Thank you. So. Now it's time for rapid questions where I'll ask you a series of this or that or yes or no questions and you answer as soon and quickly as possible. I'll um, do my best. You... Oh, perfect. <laughs> I'll take that as a I'm ready for this and I'm so excited. Cookies or cake? <laughs> cake. Cat or dog? Dog. Computer game or console game? I... Oh. Uh... <laughs> computer <laughs> i like both <laughs> you can only choose one computer then okay pop music or rock music rock rock music or r&b rock rock or hip-hop rock <laughs> rock or country rock damn okay well, <laughs> rock or rap <laughs> Rock. <laughs> I'm gonna get you to change it. Rock or dance? What's that? Like, like upbeat kind of club music? Like, inch, 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 inch. I rock. Rock. <laughs> okay, okay. Rock or lo fi? Rock. <laughs> Dang. Okay. Like again, I still like those. Like I love I love really old country stuff too. Mm -hmm. That's great. What is your favorite rock band then? Rock band. I'm, I'm hip. <laughs> What's your favorite Beatles. band? Be oh, Beatles. Okay. I'm basic. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Beatles. Very nice. Do you like alternative rock? What is that? <gasps> I'm not good with music genres. That's okay. You That'd can be elaborate. Like, what is alternative? <laughs> <laughs> All I know is that I like alternative rock and it's like has a bunch of subcategories so i'm gonna try to be careful it's like uh fallout boy or death cab for cutie okay yeah yeah okay. i like that okay cool cool <laughs> i think my chemical romance falls in that except they go into one of the sap uh subcategories okay please no one at me if i'm wrong please <laughs> <laughs> you I'm got right. your rock genres wrong Oh, you're such a poser. Oh my God, I just, I don't know. Would you rather reach someone through a text message or a phone call? I prefer phone call, but no one likes it. Yeah, <laughs> so I have to text. You're stronger than I am. <laughs> Summer or winter? Summer. I hate snow. I, that makes sense. You have snow, huh? Yeah. Not in Vancouver, but back, back in Ontario, yeah. I, I only saw snow, like once or twice in my entire life what yeah i had to go seek it why would you look for it it's awful <laughs> it, look, it looks magical in movies it Actually, always... yeah it looks it looks gorgeous it's just <laughs> when it starts melting and it turns into this muddy brown black goo that you step in <laughs> it's, it's disgusting that sounds like lies i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> tea or coffee coffee chocolate or vanilla chocolate Chocolate or strawberry? Chocolate. You're lucky I can't think of any more. Wait. <laughs> wait, wait. Are we talking about ice cream or cake? <laughs> I was thinking ice cream. Okay, perfect. Um, There's one other flavor that would Ooh, change gonna, my mind. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Okay. <laughs> um, Chocolate or coffee? Chocolate. Chocolate or green tea? Chocolate. Chocolate or, uh, crap, what else is there? Pistachio? Chocolate. <laughs> Cotton candy? Chocolate. Damn. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can tell you what it is. Okay, fine, tell me. Mango. Dang, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I love I mango. Mango anything. Mm. I don't think I would have guessed it. <laughs> I was going through my list of preferences. Even though you said pistachio, what's wrong with me? You don't like pistachio? It's like not my jam. I'd rather have green tea. Yeah, same. So good. Would you rather sing or dance? Mm, uh, dance. 
And if you dyed your hair any color, what color would it be and why? When I was younger, I wanted to dye the tips of my hair red because I thought that was cool. Oh, yeah. That's very Shadow the Hedgehog. Oh, oh my God. (laughs) I didn't even think about that. (laughs) So edgy. I just thought it looked cool. I was like, oh, my hair is kind of like on fire or something. Uh, Now I don't know if I want it. (laughs) Thank you so much, Marco, for speaking with us today. It's been a pleasure. Do you have any social media you would like to share with us? Um, You can check out my Instagram, Art of Marco Rivera is my brand. Um, No one checks it, but I still update it just because I have a blog spot (laughs) that I have since like almost 10 years now. I keep it because it's like, oh, you can look at my really old work. That's pretty bad. And you can kind of see my progression from bad to decent. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I don't update that one often. You can check my Instagram. That sounds great. <laughs> and thank you, the listener, for tuning again. Please follow Creating in Color on Instagram and Twitter. If you have any questions or want to submit any questions for upcoming guests, you can go ahead and contact me through that social media that I listed. <laughs> or my email the podcast email wow this is turning into a hot mess oh, i just remembered <laughs> another handle my vimeo you can check out my vimeo same thing art of marco Rivera. um you had your chance i'm doing the outro <laughs> <laughs> Don't I, I can't i can't i can't, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> okay um yes that gmail is creating in colorcast at gmail.com and please go to marco's vimeo i'm not a i'm not a butthole um <laughs> If you're interested in following me, you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch at Maybe It's KB. Thanks to Name Kaze for allowing us the use of his song. You can find more of his music on his SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Name Kaze. That's N-A-M-I-K-A-Z-E. Since Creating a Color is a new podcast, we appreciate it and your word of mouth or even helping to push our hashtag on social me- media. Hashtag Creating a Color Cast. If you're interested in supporting us, you can find us on coffee.com slash creating a color. Before we wrap up in that messy outro, <laughs> do you have any departing words of wisdom for everyone listening? Um, don't let your work define you. I have a life outside of work. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, too many people get caught up with like chasing the right project. And I think that's a bad mindset to have in this industry. That's words that I need to freaking follow too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. This has been Creating in Color. Keep striving. Keep trying. Keep creating. Bye. Bye.